Not that we need to trade beforehand. Not that we need It's just nonsense. Okay, we're going to pause it there and we're going to bring in Sam Coates, our deputy political <laughs> editor, who's enjoying all of this enormously, <laughs> Sam. Um, Prime Minister's questions. What are you looking forward to? What do you think we may see? Well, it's the penultimate one of, my God, quite a turbulent 2022. <laughs> and I, I, for me, what's been interesting in the last few weeks, watching those initial battles between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, is that actually Keir Starmer sort of found his line of argument um, and, and as keeps coming back to it. And it's, and it's, a, it's a critique of whether or not Rishi Sunak is, is strong. And given the events of the last few days, actually, I wonder whether or not he goes right back there. Because look at the climb down on housing targets, the climb down on uh, no onshore wind. Even, even look yesterday at the way the government wasn't able to put up a fight against Labour's attempts to force the disclosure of documents around Michelle Moan, the, the uh, Conservative peer, and what was going on with PPE. <laughs> It's not clear to me that Rishi Sunak has a great deal of parliamentary firepower to get through difficult things that he might want to do in the coming weeks or months. So I think from, from Keir Starmer's point of view, that line about whether or not Ke uh, Rishi Sunak is tough enough is, is one that certainly uh, he'll be able to point to events in the last few days when he, when he talks about, and I think this is going to be a theme of, of, of 2023, but PMQs always reflects the kind of urgent questions of the day. And... I mean, it's just strikes. Uh, you look at the misery that people are facing, the fact that some people are going out um, uh, taking industrial action. You've got what the knock-on effect of what that's going to mean for millions of people in the run-up to Christmas. I think the Tories want to point to some opinion polling from YouGov suggesting that uh, perhaps attitudes to strikes over Christmas is hardening. Now, I've been talking to pollsters about that. There's a big health warning from the way the Tories are trying to spin these polls because the question being asked is about whether or not strikes specifically just before Christmas are a good idea. Pe people don't like that. It doesn't necessarily tell you the underlying attitudes to industrial action, which has been a little bit more even Stevens in the last few weeks. But I think Rishi Sunak will want to look at, as uh, uh, Theresa Villiers was saying, the link between the unions, which are uh, giving donations to Keir Starmer and, uh, uh, and the Labour leader uh, himself as a way of capitalising on that nervousness amongst some uh, about uh, whether Labour would stand up to them as Blair did or whether they're still vestiges of uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, style of government in the past. Prime Minister's on his feet. Let's listen in. In this house, I shall have further such meetings later today. Dr Philip Wilmot. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the United Kingdom in its current form turned 100 years old. But neither the Prime Minister nor the leader of the Labour Party seem to recognise the challenge of the Supreme Court ruling as to the very nature of the union. He didn't answer me two weeks ago, so can the Prime Minister clarify if he still believes the UK is a voluntary union? And if so, can he explain the democratic route by which the people of Scotland can choose whether to stay in it or not? Well, Mr Speaker, we fully respect the decision of the Supreme Court and believe strongly in the United Kingdom. And as I said to the Honourable Lady last time, we will work constructively with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. Anthony Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Financial scams are the most common form of crime, causing immense emotional and financial distress to millions of people. And government efforts in this matter have tended to focus on making sure that scammers can't launder their proceeds of crime and that victims get compensation. Both of those are really important, but they're acting after the scam has happened. Does my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that government departments, regulators and industry, perhaps guided by an anti-scams task force, could do far more to stop scams happening in the first place? And will he meet with me to talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is right to highlight the hurt that scammers and fraudsters can cause. We are working closely with industry to block more fraudulent calls from reaching the public, and importantly, our new online safety bill will place duties on the largest internet companies to tackle scam ads. I would be happy to meet with my honourable friend to discuss further. We now come to the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I start by welcoming the new Member of Parliament for the City of Chester yeah. to her place in this house? It's the best result for Labour in the 105 years we've been fighting that seat, and I look forward to working with her to build a better future for the people of Chester. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party promised the country it would build 300,000 houses a year. 
This week, without asking a single voter, the Prime Minister broke that promise by scrapping mandatory targets. What changed? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, let me start by also welcoming the Honourable Lady to her, to her place. Now, the Honourable Gentleman comes here every week, and I know he's focused on the process and the politics, but I don't think he's actually taken the time to read the detail of what we are doing to improve our planning system. So let me, let me just explain what we are doing. We are, Mr Speaker, we are protecting the green belt. We are investing millions to develop brownfield sites. And we're providing support and protection for local neighbourhood plans. Just, just this morning, the Shadow Housing Secretary said, she said, communities should have control over where homes are built and what sort of homes are built. That's my position, that's her position. What's his position? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, does he really expect us to believe that the member for Chipping Barton and the member for the Isle of Wight are cheering him on because he's going to build more homes? Pull the other one. I'll tell him, I'll tell him what changed. His backbenchers threatened him. And as always, the Blamange Prime Minister wobbled. He did a grubby deal with a handful of his MPs and sold out the aspirations of those who want to own their own home. Was it worth it? Mr Speaker, as ever, as ever, engaging in the petty personality politics, not, 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 not focused on the substance. Again, let me explain what we're doing. We're delivering what I said we would do. We're protecting the character of local communities. We're cracking down on land banking and irresponsible developers. And we're giving people a greater say in their decisions. Just this week, Mr Speaker, just this week, on Monday, the Honourable Gentleman said the government should be giving people more power and control. Now, 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 now he seems to be opposing that policy. It's only Wednesday. I know he flip-flops, but even for him it's pretty quick. Mr Speaker, he's forgotten. Last week, last week I offered him Labour votes to pass these housing targets because this is bigger than politics. The former Housing Secretary, on their side, said scrapping mandatory targets would, this is his words from their side of the House, be a colossal failure of political leadership. No wonder he doesn't want to fight the next election, Mr Speaker. The author of the manifesto that they all stood on said it would cut building by 40%, perhaps even more. Why would he rather cripple house building than work with us to get those targets through? Mr Speaker, we're not going to work with the Labour Party on housing. You know why? We'll have a look at their record on housing. In, in London, in London, the form, in London, the former Conservative mayor in five years built 60,000 affordable homes. Yeah. The current Labour mayor, half of that amount. Yeah. In Wales, in Wales, we want to build 12,000 homes. What are Labour delivering? Half of that, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Labour Party talks, the Conservatives deliver. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, as ever, too weak to stand up to his own side on behalf of the country. Mr Speaker, I, I, I noticed there was another U-turn last night, this time on wind farms. I, I actually, I agree with that one, but is there no issue on which he won't give in to his backbenchers? Now, Mr Speaker, how did his colleague, Baroness Moan, end up with nearly £30 million of taxpayers' money in her bank account? Yeah. Oh. M Mr Speaker, let me say, l like everyone else, I was absolutely shocked to read about the allegations. <laughs> it's absolutely right. <laughs> it's, it's, abso it's absolutely right that she is no longer attending the House of Lords and therefore no longer has the Conservative whip. The, again, I, the one thing we know about the Honourable Gentleman, he is a lawyer, he should know there's a process in place. 
it's right that that process concludes. I hope that it's resolved promptly. But I say one thing, Mr. Speaker, because he, he, I tell him, he mentioned, I tell him what is weak. I tell him what is weak is not being able to. I tell him, and that's not being able to stand up to people. Just, I know he's taken some advice from Gordon Brown lately. <laughs> Why doesn't, why doesn't he listen to a former minister in Gordon Brown's government who just said, why does the Labour Party refuse to stand up for workers in businesses like pubs and restaurants who will lose business as a result of the train strikes? Labour should stand up for working people. If he's strong, that's what he should do. M Mr Speaker, it, it may not seem like it, but he's supposed to be the Prime Minister. This morning... This morning, his transport secretary said that his flagship legislation on strikes, this is what he said this morning, his transport secretary, might want to listen to this, is clearly, is clearly not going to help with the industrial action we're facing. He should stop grandstanding, stop sitting on his hands, get round the table and resolve these issues. And everyone can see what's happening here. A Tory politician got their hands on hundreds of millions in taxpayers' money and then provided Duff PPE. And he says he's shocked. He was the Chancellor. He, he signed the cheques. How much is he going to get back? Yeah. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's right that he brought up legislation with regard to strikes, and I'm very happy to address it, actually. So, hard-working families right now in this country are facing challenges. The government has been reasonable. It's accepted the recommendations of an independent pay body, giving pay rises in many cases higher than the private sector. But if the union leaders to continue to be unreasonable, then it is my duty to take action to protect the lives and livelihoods of the British public. And that's why, Mr Speaker, since I became Prime Minister, I have been working for new, tough laws to protect people from this disruption. That's the legislation he's asking about. Will he now confirm that he'll stand up for working people and that he and his party will back that legislation? Mr Speaker, he, he's, obviously, he's obviously not heard what his Transport Secretary said about that legislation this morning. And it's obvious why they're so opposed to Labour's plans to clean up Westminster. They all voted for tax rises for working people, while one of their unelected peers pocketed millions flogging dodgy PPE. You should be ashamed. Now, Mr Speaker, I want to raise something that is worrying parents across the country. Our hearts, our hearts go out to the families of the children who have tragically died from the outbreak of Strep A in recent weeks. I am very happy to work with the Government on this. So, can he take the opportunity to update the country on the measures the country is taking to keep children safe this winter? Well, Mr Speaker, my thoughts are, of course, with the families of the children who have sadly lost their lives. We are seeing a higher number of cases from Strep A this year compared to usual. Uh, what I can say is that the NHS, who I have sat down to talk about this, are working very hard to make sure parents are aware of the symptoms that they should be looking out to, because this can be treated appropriately with uh, antibiotics. There are no current shortages of drugs available to treat this, and there are well-established procedures in place to ensure that that remains uh, the case. And the UK SHA are monitoring the situation uh, at pace, and what they have confirmed is that there is, this is not a new strain of strep A, so people should be reassured about that. There is no reason to believe that it has become more lethal or more resistant to antibiotics, so the most important thing for parents to do is look out for the symptoms and get the treatment that is available for them. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Airbnb type short term lets provide a positive experience for many holidaymakers, but too many cause real issues for local communities. In Westminster, we have 13,000 Airbnb properties alone. Does my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that it is now time to consider a registration scheme yeah. managed by local authorities so councils can properly manage this growing sector? Here, here. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, my right honourable friend, the levelling up secretary, has indeed said that we will deliver a new 
tourist accommodation registration scheme, something I know my honourable friend uh, has asked for. It will increase appropriate regulation of the sector, better understand and monitor the impact on local communities, and we will also consult on whether planning permissions should be required for new short-term holiday lets, especially in tourist hotspots. Can I welcome the new leader of the SNP and thank you, Blackford, please. Stephen. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I wish to begin by paying tribute to my friend and colleague, the Right Honourable Member for Ross Sky and Loch Aber, who has served us with diligence and duty for the last five years. Mr Speaker, he is a giant of the Scottish independence movement. Mr Speaker, he's seen off not one, not two, but three consecutive Tory Prime Ministers. Indeed, he was on to his fourth in recent weeks. And to that latest Prime Minister, I have a very simple question. What does he consider to be the greatest achievement of the Conservative Party in government since 2019? Leaving the single market and customs union, ending freedom of movement, denying Scotland her democracy, or getting the Labour Party to agree with all of the above? Mr Speaker, can I start by offering my genuine and warm, heartfelt best wishes to the Right Honourable Member for Ross Sky and Loch I know, I know the whole House will miss his weekly contributions. Um, and and, may, and may, I, may I also congratulate or join the First Minister in congratulating the Honourable Gentleman on his appointment as a Westminster leader of the SNP. I look forward to a constructive debate uh, with him across the dispatch box. And Mr Speaker, the answer to this question is actually very simple. The things that we are most proud of in the last couple of years is making sure that we protected this country through the pandemic yeah. with, with furlough and with the fastest vaccine rollout. Yeah. Mr Speaker, far be it for me to offer advice to a near billionaire, but he's going to have to up his game. And here's why, because in the last 15 minutes, a poll has landed which shows that support for Scottish independence has now hit 56%. Yeah. And support for the Scottish National Party sits north of 50%. So in that context, can I ask the Prime Minister, does he consider that increasing energy bills on households in energy-rich Scotland by a further £500 will cause those poll numbers to rise or to fall? Well, Mr Speaker, what we're delivering for households across the United Kingdom, including those in Scotland, is £55 billion of support with energy bills. It will save a typical homeowner about £900 under their bills this winter with extra support for the most vulnerable. And that is, Mr Speaker, an example of the United Kingdom and the Union delivering for people in Scotland. Yeah. David Morris. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Eden Project North is now... Oh. Getting right to the end of the process, it's gone through right to the levelling up stage two. It has planning permission, it has land allocation, it has everything that's going to offer the north of England. Prime Minister, when are we going to be getting the Eden Project North? Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend, I think the whole House knows my honourable friend has been a pan passionate campaigner uh, for, for Eden North for some time. I was pleased to work with him in my, my previous role. He knows I can't comment on any specific bid, uh, but I know that the Secretary of State will be making these decisions by the end of the year, and I wish him and everyone involved in the project every success. Stephen Farley. Uh, thank you. Most people and businesses in Northern Ireland accept the need for the protocol and want to see negotiated pragmatic solutions to the various challenges. While there has been a clear improvement in the mood music between the UK and the European Union over recent weeks, there is a growing frustration and concern at the slow rate of actual progress in those talks. So what steps can the Prime Minister take to inject some momentum into those negotiations? And indeed, can I encourage him to visit Northern Ireland <coughs> as soon as possible, preferably before Christmas, to engage with local stakeholders around the protocol and also to hear views on how the Assembly can be restored via reform? Well, can I, I thank my, uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his, his question, and, and uh, I enjoyed meeting him recently to discuss these issues. Let me give him and the people of Northern Ireland my uh, assurance that I want to see the issues with the protocol resolved as quickly as possible. Uh, I do believe that if people enter into these talks that we are having in a spirit of goodwill and pragmatism, that we can indeed find a way through. My right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary and Vice President Sefcovic, are in regular dialogue, uh, and I will take on board his suggestion to come visit Northern Ireland to discuss these things in person. Yeah. Baron Henry. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. We just had Small Business Saturday where we mark the important impact small businesses have on our local communities. I, like many of my colleagues, have spoken to these businesses and heard just how great their concerns are for their future. When the Prime Minister was Chancellor earlier this year, he went with me to Fred Hallam in Beeston, a business established in 1908. SMEs such as this face their pandemic and now rising energy costs. Can the Prime Minister lay out how he will ensure businesses such as Fred Hallam will be supported in the coming months so that they may thrive and continue to provide vital goods and services to my constituents in Broxtow. Thank you. Well, I know my honourable friend is a fantastic champion of his local businesses. It was a privilege to visit uh, Beeston and Hallam's uh, earlier this year with him. And I remember we discussed then some of the things we were planning to do, which are now going to make a big difference. Saving businesses hundreds or thousands of pounds with their energy bills through our relief scheme this winter, our business rates tax cuts package worth over 13 billion, particularly impacting retail businesses and with initiatives like the annual investment allowance and help to grow we can take his small businesses to a whole new level i look forward to working with him on that yeah. thank you mr speaker a recent set for the select committees both the author of the government's own national food strategy and the united nations special rapporteur on the rights of food a call for universal free school meals to address the issue of the four million children hungry in the uk Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss how investments in universal free school meals will benefit children and their families in Liverpool, West Derby and the country, and at no extra cost to the taxpayer? Yeah. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I know this is uh, an issue on which the Honourable Gentleman has campaigned for some time, and uh, he's right to highlight the importance of making sure our children have access to food. That's why I'm proud that we introduced not just uh, an expansion of uh, free school meals, but also the holiday activity and food programme. I'm always interested in more ideas uh, where we can go further. I look forward to hearing from him. Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whether on defence with AUKUS, trade with CPTPP, or diplomacy with ASEAN, I know this government recognises the importance of the Indo-Pacific to the UK's security and prosperity, but the challenges that exist, whether they are ballistic missile tests or the Belt and Road, are deeply interconnected. So can the Prime Minister confirm that the Indo-Pacific remains a UK priority and that he will take a holistic approach uh, within government to meet the challenges and capture the opportunities that exist in the region? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, last year's integrated review set out our Indo-Pacific tilt with regard to foreign policy. I reaffirmed this government's commitment to that tilt uh, in a speech at the Lord Mayor's dinner just the other week, and he's right to highlight both the economic and security importance of the region. Uh, he should be reassured that we're pursuing not just free trade agreements uh, bilaterally, but also CPTPP, the AUKUS partnership, and indeed, hopefully, a, a new partnership with regard to our future combat air system, all evidence that we are delivering on the tilt. Shabon Mike Dobber. Mr Speaker, members across this House know the devastating impact of bank branch closures on our communities. But as blank banks flee the high streets, our free cash machines disappear with them, hitting the most vulnerable hardest. Surely it cannot be right that a quarter of ATMs charge people to access their own money. So will the Prime Minister join dozens of his own backbenchers today in backing my cross-party amendment and ensure that everyone has free access to their hard-earned money? Well, Mr Speaker, this government is indeed legislating to safeguard access to cash, and that's what the Financial Services and Markets Bill this afternoon uh, will do through a very significant intervention. Uh, I also, I'm also pleased that we put in place initiatives with the industry to subsidise free-to-use ATMs in deprived areas, and almost 50 communities are benefiting from our new shared cash facilities, because access to cash is important, and that's what our new bill will deliver. Manchester. Thank you, Mr. Mr Speaker, I very much welcome the Government's commitment to its hospital buildings programme. Can the Prime Minister clarify what criteria will be applied for the allocation of those new hospitals? And will it be done in line with the Prime Minister's personal commitment on a merits-based system 
of government. Because my hospital in Medway serves half a million people and is the busiest hospital, A&E, in Kent. We have some of the highest health inequalities in the country. We were one of the hardest hit areas in Medway during COVID-19. We need our fair share allocation of resources in Medway. Will the Prime Minister visit Medway Hospital for, with me and fellow local MPs to look at our urgent needs? Well, my, uh, my honourable friend is a fantastic champion for his local area, but especially uh, for his local hospital. He'll know that I can't comment on any specific scheme, but I can tell him that submissions to be one of the new hospitals are currently being reviewed in the department, and an announcement will be made shortly. Very Kelly Foy. Thank, yeah, yeah. thank you, Mr Speaker. On Small Business Saturday, I was delighted to name Daisy Rose Coffee House as the City of Durham's Small Business of the Year 2022 after yeah. a public yeah, yeah. vote in my inaugural award. Yeah. But like so many small businesses, Daisy Rose Coffee House is the beaten heart of the local community and the cornerstone of, in their high street. But so many business owners that I meet with feel utterly ignored by the government as they're clobbered by outdated business rates yep. year after year. Yeah. The government must pick a side. Are they going to continue with the, to, to back the online giants or will they join the Labour Party and back small business and scrap and replace the outdated business rates? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, can I congratulate Daisy Rose for winning uh, their award and being the beating heart of their high street. Uh, I very much hope that they will benefit, and I'm almost certain they will, from our discounts on business rates. Our retail, hospitality and leisure relief, uh, relief gives a 75% discount on business rates in the next financial year, and that comes on top of the support that we'll be providing Daisy Rose and others with their energy bills, with bills being about half of what they would have otherwise been without our support. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, can I thank you and colleagues across the House for your kindness and encouragement in recent weeks? Can I ask my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, this afternoon to recommit the government he leads to our ambition of levelling up communities in every part of our great United Kingdom? And to that end, could I invite my right honourable friend to come and visit my Bournemouth West constituency? and see the latest school rebuild, the multi-million pound rebuild of the Oak Academy, which will stand as a lasting tribute of opportunity to the people I have the privilege of serving in this House. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, can I say that it's very nice to hear from my right honourable friend today, and, and he's absolutely right. There is no better way to spread opportunity around the country than by investing in our children's future. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that Oak Academy in his constituency is benefiting from our school rebuilding programme, and I will certainly ask my office to keep his kind invitation in mind. Alan Dorrance. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I've read this matter before, but despite meeting with a previous Prime Minister in 2020, this matter has not progressed. In 1984, I was a serving police officer on the Metropolitan Police, when on the 17th of April, WPC Von Fletcher was shot in the back and killed while he was policing a political demonstration outside the Libyan Embassy. No one has ever been charged in connection with her murder. In November last year, in delivering his judgment in a civil case, a senior High Court Justice, Mr Justice Spencer, said, I am satisfied that on the balance of probabilities that the defendant, Sally Mabrook, is jointly liable for the shooting of WPC Yvonne Fletcher on the doctrine of common design. Mm. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to see how this case may be taken forward and finally bring those responsible for the murder of Yvonne to justice in a criminal court? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I thank the honourable gentleman for his continued work on this case, as he said, it's something that he has raised before. Uh, he'll appreciate that why I can't speak in detail on any particular case, there are differences in the standard of proof required for civil and criminal proceedings. You know, that said, the CPS will consider any new information that is referred to them by the police in relation to this case, and of course, I'd be very happy to meet with him. Jackie Doyle Price. Uh, returning to the theme of communities being able to decide where to build, in Thorough we embrace uh, the, our obligations to deliver more new homes and at Arena Essex we have an application to deliver 2,500 new homes ready to go. However, 
There is a standing objection to any development over 300 homes from national highways because of the impact on Junction 30 and M25. Could I ask my right honourable friend what advice he gives to Thurrock Council as to how they can deliver their housing obligations with this national constraint? Uh, well, well uh, Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for her question, and she highlights a great example of a council that is trying to do the right thing and put the right homes in the right places. They should have our support. If I'd ask her, please, to write to my right honourable friend, the levelling up secretary, with the details of the issue so we can give her a full response, uh, but praise her council to try to make sure that we can build the homes where we need them. Dame Diana Johnson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Why can't the government process asylum claims within six months, thereby saving £5.6 million a day on asylum seeking seekers' accommodation, granting asylum to those who need it quickly, and stopping the abuse of the system, which currently has a backlog of 147,000 asylum claims? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, what we are doing is significantly increasing the number of case workers. We are on course to double it uh, by next spring, with several hundred already uh, in place. Uh, and, and she is right that the process takes longer than it should. Often, that is because people are able to exploit some of the rules in our system uh, and make sequential claims. That is exactly the type of thing that the Home Secretary and I are working on fixing. And I look forward to having the party opposite its support when we do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, there have been more reported deaths and adverse reactions uh, following mRNA vaccination in 18 months than there has been to every uh, conventional vaccine administered worldwide for the last 50 years. And given that mRNA vaccines are not recommended for pregnant women or those who are breastfeeding, would my right honourable friend overturn the big pharma funded MHRA's recent recommendation that these uh, experimental vaccines are administered to children as, as young as six months of age? Yeah. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, let me first say that I believe COVID vaccines are indeed safe and effective. Yeah. But, and no, no vaccine, COVID or otherwise, will be approved unless it meets the UK regulator standards of safety, quality and effectiveness. Uh, we have an independent body. The JCVI determines which age groups the vaccine is recommended for use in as part of the vaccination programme. And, of course, the ultimate decision will lie with parents. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During COVID, we all applauded our NHS nurses who put their lives on the line to help millions of our constituents and our loved ones. But we now know that at the same time, Tory spivs were helping themselves, using their connections and COVID to help themselves to millions of pounds of public money. Why is the Prime Minister on the side of the spivs and not on the side of the nurses? Mr Speaker, uh, what, what everyone was doing at the time was working as hard and as quickly as they could to get the PPE to, to, get, to get the PPE needed for our frontline workers, including our nurses. Actually, there was an independent procurement process. Ministers were not involved in the decision making. But it was right, it was right, Mr Speaker, but that people gave their ideas about where to get them from. Indeed, the Shadow Chancellor herself suggested that we should get PPE from a law firm. She suggested we should get ventilators from a football agent. Everyone was trying as hard as they can. We should remember the context and stop playing politics. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, more than 350 people attended a meeting in Skegness to discuss the use of five seafront hotels to house asylum seekers. They were united in their view that there was a long-term economic impact and a pressure on public services. They told me loud and clear that, like the Prime Minister, they think hotels are the wrong place for asylum seekers. Does he agree with me that the government needs urgently to lay out a plan that moves beyond the use of hotels, puts asylum seekers in the right place for them and the right place for coastal communities such as those in Skegness? Yeah. 
Yeah, I completely agree with my honourable friend. That it, we are now spending £6 million a day housing asylum seekers. Uh, hotels are incredibly expensive. Uh, we will urgently bring forward proposals to reduce the pressure, but as he knows, as I know, the best way to solve this problem sustainably is to reduce the number of illegal migrants coming to the United yeah. Kingdom, and that's what this government will deliver. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Audit Wales has confirmed that the Welsh Labour Government responded well and got on with the job of delivering value for taxpayers' money. Can the Prime Minister tell the House what first attracted him to awarding billion pounds of COVID contracts to Tory donors and supporters, and what is he doing to claw taxpayers' money back? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, Mr Speaker, we delivered 32 billion pieces of PPE to the front line at a time when there was a global shortage. Uh, as I've already said, everyone tried to do their bit. We heard recommendations from the Shadow Chancellor, but it was right that hers and everyone else's suggestions went through an independent process where ministers were not involved in the decisions. Robin Walker. Josh McAllister's independent review of children's social care has been with the government since May, and I understand there's been some disappointment that the response to it won't be published uh, before Christmas. But can the Prime Minister ensure, given the very important recommendations about some of the most vulnerable children in our society and the families who support them, the people who support them, uh, that there will be a strong and robust government response as early as possible in the new year? Yeah. Yes, my, uh, my uh, honourable friend obviously knows this subject area well. He's right to highlight the importance of making sure that we do provide good quality support to vulnerable children. The report has a lot of interesting suggestions in it, and he's right, uh, and I can commit to him, we will respond in due course. Final question, Claire Hanna. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, over 70% of Northern Ireland's international tourists arrive to Dublin and travel across the land border. The UK government's proposed electronic travel authorisation would likely mean the North being struck off the itinerary uh, of operators and many independent travellers. And the last thing we need is a barrier to one of our biggest economic drivers, to say nothing of the impact of no on non-Irish and British people living in Ireland. Uh, members from across the House have acknowledged that our border uh, isn't a normal one. Will the Prime Minister commit to scrapping this unworkable proposal? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I can give the Honourable Lady my assurance that we remain very committed to the common travel area and indeed do not want to see any checks on the island of Ireland and that's why we're working very hard to resolve the issues with the protocol and ensure Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it's not on this wheel. Right, let us go on to the urgent question. Urgent question, Dame Margaret Hodge. Well, as the uh, House of Commons empties after Prime Minister's questions, uh, let's just reflect on what we heard over the last 35 minutes or so. Our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates is here in the Westminster studio with me. Um, Sam, the Prime Minister, this is last but one before Christmas, um, the Prime Minister being pushed by Keir Starmer again. He seems to be going on this weakness theme that he we've heard in previous uh, PMQs that, that the Prime Minister seems to be flip-flopping, seems to be changing and starting off targeting him on a sort of U-turn on housing. That's right. Uh, another climb down from the Prime Minister over housing targets last night and Keir Starmer used that to return to a theme that he's pursued in several of the Prime Minister's question uh, exchanges with Rishi Sunak. Um, he called, Keir Starmer called Rishi Sunak the blancmange Prime Minister. <laughs> If I'm being completely honest, it was a bit of, of a blancmange Prime Minister's questions. Well, at the heart of these exchanges, always the, the Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak exchanges. And, and what Keir Starmer did this week is he hopped around. There were uh, sort of four different subjects on the table. There were those housing targets we were just talking about. There was uh, Michelle Moan, uh, the uh, Tory peer, uh, and, and what went on with PPE. There was uh, an exchange about strikes, and then there were the deaths... Uh, uh, the strep A deaths that he um, uh, uh, that have been um, claiming lies, lies very sadly all around the country in, um, in recent days, um, but uh, and across all of that, that meant that in political terms, uh, not a great deal of momentum was was was, was got up. Uh, I think um, there were a couple of sort of striking news lines. Um, one was that uh, effectively uh, he made clear that he would definitely press ahead with strike, new strike laws. He talked about new minimum service laws when it comes to strike action uh, and challenged Keir Starmer over whether he would uh, support those. Well, we've got that uh, clip actually about strikes. Let's listen to it.
<laughs> this morning, his transport secretary said that his flagship legislation on strikes, this is what he said this morning, his transport secretary, might want to listen to this, is clearly, is clearly not going to help with the industrial action we're facing. He should stop grandstanding, stop sitting on his hands, get round the table and resolve these issues. And everyone can see what's happening here. A Tory politician got their hands on hundreds of millions in taxpayers' money and then provided Duff PPE, and he says he's shocked. He was the Chancellor. He, he signed the cheques. How much is he going to get back? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's right that he brought up legislation with regard to strikes, and I'm very happy to address it, actually. So, hard-working families right now in this country are facing challenges. The government has been reasonable. It's accepted the recommendations of an independent pay body, giving pay rises in many cases higher than the private sector. But if the union leaders to continue to be unreasonable, then it is my duty to take action to protect the lives and livelihoods of the British public. And that's why, Mr Speaker, since I became Prime Minister, I have been working for new, tough laws to protect people from this disruption. That's the legislation he's asking about. Will he now confirm that he'll stand up for working people and that he and his party will back that legislation? I mean, Keir Starmer is on one level right to say that the legislation that Rishi Sunak was just talking about at the end of that section won't be ready in time because it takes nine months to pass legislation. Uh, the train strikes, for instance, are taking place next week. Um, there has been a hardening of the line inside government in recent days, and it doesn't look as if they're going to go beyond the kind of 3-4% um, pay offer that's currently on the table for the RMT and other bits of the public sector. It, the government doesn't have a great deal of spare cash to throw around, as well as being concerned about uh, inflation and, 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 and the like. So I, I think we are in for a grim few weeks. Politically, the Conservatives are, are just wondering whether or not there isn't a potential for tying union activity to the Labour leadership, not least there were donation figures suggesting uh, or showing that the unions still continue to give to the Labour Party uh, that were released yesterday. But um, it's an interesting area whether or not the techniques that the Conservative government can adopt to tighten the screw on union leaders, start to demonise them more, start to threaten them more, uh, actually do drive a wedge between the public and the Labour Party. The Labour Party currently 20 points ahead in the polls, as you were talking to the MPs earlier. I, we, we'll just have to wait and see, but it's, uh, it, it's a story that will dominate the next three or four months. There's a, there's a secret, though, behind the scenes in British politics, because... Labour Party aren't saying they give huge amounts more money, uh, match, you know, what the unions want, just as the Conservatives aren't. And that's because both sides are absolutely praying that those independent forecasts about what's going to happen to inflation do what they say, which is uh, inflation round about 10% now, but plunges to round 3% by the end of next year. And so this issue about strikes goes away because basically prices take care of themselves. So that's what both sides are hoping. Maybe this issue around strikes is, a, is more temporary than anything else. But certainly, in this wave of industrial action, new laws are a more political gesture and dividing line than they are something that, that are going to help people get on with their lives. OK, Sam, thanks very much for taking us through Prime Minister's questions. Well, let's look at some of the rest of the day's news. And the Kremlin has denied suggestions it's planning a second major offensive on Ukraine, warning critics to ignore provocative messages online. Drone attacks thought to be from the Ukrainian side have continued to strike far into Russian territory over recent days as the battles for control rage on. Meanwhile, trench warfare continues on parts of the front line. Our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes, sent this report. Even tea breaks are treacherous here. The troops barely flinch, hardened by months of war. With the front line quite literally freezing, they focus on different priorities, to a point. <laughs> that one was too near, he says, though they still don't move. There were some really close incidents that landed on the road just above here, so we're staying low. We all head for better cover. 
the Russian artillery round slammed down for nearly half an hour. We've had to take shelter because there was too much incoming going on outside. We're not allowed to film where we are at the moment, but while we've been sitting here, we've heard explosions up above, making this whole shelter shudder. It's pretty terrifying, and this is what the soldiers have to go through. Finally, we're able to escape. A tense scramble.